Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us here again today at the Loft here in San Francisco. Uh, we've got a full day here talking about serverless content, uh, quite a lot of topics that we're going to cover for the whole day. And so uh, thank you again here for joining us. My name is Chris Munz. I am currently principal and lead developer advocate for serverless at AWS. I'm actually based out of our New York City office, so came all the way out here today to spend some time with you. Uh, I've been here at AWS for a little over six and a half years across a couple different roles. Uh, including representing our DevOps space for a little while and being a solutions architect. And then before that, I actually worked for a number of startups in the New York City area, uh, companies like Etsy and Meetup, primarily on the infrastructure, what you might call DevOps or SRE type of a role. So why are we here today? So all this week here at The Loft, we are doing a recap on things that happened at uh, AWS reInvent 2018. For those of you who have never been to it before, reInvent is our yearly uh, user and developer conference that we run in Las Vegas. And one of the hot, hottest topics that we had this year, again, was this concept of serverless. And so throughout today, we're going to cover a number of different topics in this space, uh, kind of going across uh, from kind of beginning stuff all the way up through a number of the services that play into this space. So serverless, what does this mean? So it's kind of an industry buzzword these days. It means a lot of things to a lot of different people. But for us here at AWS, it comes down to really kind of four key criteria for how we think about what serverless means. And so we kind of have four guiding principles that we think about uh, that in our minds say whether or not something is or isn't serverless. And so for us, it means there being no servers to provision or manage. This means no physical, no virtual, uh, no really like container orchestration that you would ever have to think about yourself. Should scale with usage. So as requests come in or data comes in or events come in, uh, the platform that is serverless should automatically scale to handle that and, and do whatever it needs to do for interacting or solving for that request. We have a term that we use now called pay for value. We sometimes would say not pay for idle or pay for just what you use. And really when we talk about pay for value, we're talking about this idea that if you have resources that are sitting idle, that aren't being used, that aren't, say, sitting waiting for requests that you're paying for, that in our mind is wasted money. And so with the services that we're going to talk about here today, uh, pretty much almost all of them, you're not going to pay anything if they're not in use. And I'd like to give the example of if you're at an organization that has, say, an app that's used internally, and you're primarily, say, a nine to five kind of shop, that means all those other hours in the week you're paying for that infrastructure you might be, not be using. But in the world of serverless, that's not something that happens. And then lastly, availability and fault tolerance built in. So here at AWS, we have a concept of regions. Uh, there's uh, over 18 of those, I believe, today globally that you can run your infrastructure inside of. Inside of those regions are a concept called availability zones. You can think of availability zones as essentially different data centers that exist within this geographically bound region, such that one of the most uh, basic principles of building for fault tolerance and high availability at AWS is this concept of building across availability zones. Now, in a traditional, more serverful model, you would be thinking about running infrastructure in those yourself and doing things like load balancing or mapping requests across them. But as we see today in the serverless space, you won't uh, have to think about that as much with the products and the services that we're going to be talking about. Now, those are kind of uh, guiding principles that we have on our side for what we say serverless is. But when we talk to customers about what serverless means for them and what it's brought to them, uh, it means a number of different things the way that they see it. So when customers talk to us about what they see from serverless, they see kind of the benefits that you see listed here. So greater agility, they're able to move faster because they're spending less time on infrastructure. They're not dealing with a lot of the overhead and setting up of, of various things like servers and operating systems and all of that. And that aligns with things like being able to better focus on just their business need. So being able to focus their energy on writing the code, on building their applications, on talking to their customers, on iterating, learning what it is that they uh, would want to get uh, into their product. Uh, things like increased scale. So we have organizations that are doing things at a scale that they would have never been able to do in their own data centers, in terms of things like data ingestion, data processing, uh, being able to scale out a product, say, for a specific period of time. Right? Maybe you deal with something like a Super Bowl that's coming up in a couple of weeks. You, know, you wouldn't want to run that infrastructure for that event 24-7 for an entire year. Uh, but in the case of things like serverless, it's the kind of stuff where you can have very bursty, quick workloads that get dealt with. Greater flexibility, faster time to market, et cetera. So really what we're going to see today is just kind of the ease of use of what it is that we're going to, what's possible with these products. Now, in this first hour here, our focus is going to be around a product called AWS Lambda. Uh, AWS Lambda is a compute service. It was first announced a little over four years ago and then became generally available. Uh, it'll be four years in April. 
So a product that's been around for a couple of years. And now Lambda sits at the intersection of a couple of different concepts and ideas for us here in the industry. Uh, the first is that what we've seen is as microservices as an architectural paradigm have grown in popularity in say the last decade or so, that has led to this concept of event-driven compute. Essentially thinking of the individual actions and flows and bits of ways that your, develop, that your customers interface with your product as individual kind of workflows within the greater uh, capabilities of what it is that your products do. And so we could take all of the various capabilities all the ways to interface and break it down in these individual events. That event model aligns with being able to think of your application code directly aligning to them. And so that's kind of led to this concept of functions as a service. Functions that align to the events that make up the greater whole of your application. And then at the center of this, what we have is a serverless functions as a service offering, which is Lambda. And so Lambda meets the four kind of CREA criteria that I talked about before. You don't run any servers or infrastructure yourself. You're not doing any operating system patching or installing of software. It scales for use. You pay for the value that you get out of it, and it's going to be highly available by default. And so uh, there are uh, the, the fast service itself, the fast industry, I should say, itself uh, has grown in the last number of years. Uh, there's a number of options out there in the industry. There's open source options. There's options from other cloud providers. Um, but as we'll see here with Lambda today, there's quite a lot of capabilities that it has. And now, we talk more about what Lambda is. I think sometimes people lose a little bit of all of the complexity that Lambda hides from you. It really takes a lot of the layers under the stack and makes it so that you don't have to deal with them. And so Lambda isn't just a comparison to, say, a virtual machine or a server that might be sitting somewhere. It's a compute service that provides things like load balancing and auto scaling and failure handling and operating system management, security management, uh, utilization management. Lots of things that Lambda is doing behind the scenes that if you were to build and do this yourself would be quite a lot of complexity and quite a lot of work. Now, I mentioned Lambda was first uh, announced a little over four years ago. It was actually at uh, reInvent 2014, so our user conference back then. And it's a pretty mature product in terms of how we think of things here at AWS. Again, it's been out for just about four years. Uh, and in those four years, we've seen a lot of things go into Lambda. Uh, this is something that I put together uh, back at the end of October slash about early November. And basically what it spells out is we had a new feature or capability launched into Lambda every month for the last four years. So quite a lot of capabilities. Today, Lambda serves uh, trillions of events or it has trillions of events that process through the system per month. Um, so it's at a pretty massive scale as well. And that's, again, driven by customer workloads on the platform. Now, Lambda doesn't just sit inside of a vacuum. When we talk about Lambda and the context for what it provides, it sits inside of what is considered a serverless application. And now, a serverless application typically has two or three components to it. It has the event source, so what it is that's going to cause a triggering of that Lambda function. It has then the Lambda function, and it has potentially whatever it is that your Lambda function needs to connect to a database, a data store, another internet-facing service, uh, technically anything that could run open on a, a network port you could connect to from Lambda. And so on the event source side, we've got uh, a little over 40 different services today that directly interact with Lambda, um, plus our own uh, API, which we'll talk about here in, in a little bit, that you could just write code against yourself. And so this is things like requests to API gateways, uh, responding to an object being put in an S3 bucket, uh, doing things like pulling messages out of a queue, um, a number of and different ways that you can interface with Lambda, and, and we'll talk and look at some of these a little bit more closely here today. In terms of your function, so uh, the initial model that we've had here at Lambda is that we provide basically curated execution environments that have various different programming languages built in for you. And so we first launched with uh, Node.js and Python and added Java and C Sharp and Go, and then just here back at reInvent added Ruby, and then something called the Runtime API. And I'm going to talk about that briefly here, but then later today we're going to explore the Runtime API uh, in, in much greater depth. Uh, and essentially what the Runtime API allows you to do is at this point now bring any language that you want to to Lambda. So you're no longer restricted by just the languages that we were providing to you. And then again, in terms of what you talk to from your Lambda function, this is entirely up to you. Whatever it is that your code needs to interface with, you can interface with it. There's no restrictions or blockers from our side. You write your code. It contains your business logic. It does what it has to do. So let's actually hold here. Let's, you know, this is kind of abstract. Let's actually dive in and see what this looks like and, and see what we can do here. So I'm going to hop out of uh, presentation mode here. 
and go to the AWS console. Make this a little bit bigger for everybody. Uh, so for those of you who have maybe never seen this before, this is the AWS console. Uh, we've got here, uh, you know, 140 plus services basically. There's quite a long list of things that you could go in and explore and play with. We're gonna start here with Lambda. So I'm gonna go into the Lambda console and I am going to create a new function. As you can see, I've got a number of other functions here. So let's call this function hello loft sf. I am gonna make this a Python function and uh, it needs to create a role. This is basically the permissioning that this function will use and we'll talk a little bit more about this here in a bit. And now I'm just gonna go ahead and say create. Oops, yeah, I'll name this. takes a moment or two here for it to go and create some sample code for me. Okay, cool. So now I am looking at the configuration uh, of this Lambda function that I have. It right now has uh, just the raw function itself. I can scroll down here and I can view the code for this function. It's very, very basic. We see there's just about uh, eight lines plus some white space. Um, and what is going to happen in here is I'm going to execute this function called Lambda Handler, uh, and then it's just going to return some, some basic text. So it's gonna say hello from Lambda. Let's go ahead and change this to hello from the SF loft. And now we can save this. And now we can go and execute this. So inside the console here, I can click test. I can create an event, and I'm just gonna create a blank event because I don't need to do anything with this. Say create and say test. So let's go back up. Cool. And it tells me here the little green box is good. If it was bad, it would be a red box. Uh, in this case, it says that it spit out this, this uh, JSON structure, which says hello from the SF loft. There's a status code for it. I can see that this took 0.24 milliseconds, uh, that I used 19 megabytes of memory for this and I see a bunch of information that looks like what would be log lines from Lambda. Now what happened behind the scenes here, right? So I have this code, it was saved, I have a configured Lambda function that represents this code. When I clicked test, what happened was, behind the scenes, the Lambda service went and said, okay, we have an event, it's destined for this function that belongs to Chris's account, we're going to find a compute resource that's available, we're gonna pull down Chris's code on that, we're gonna start up the execution environment, we're gonna pull in the event and then execute it all. And so this was a very, very basic example of all that happening, but again, behind the scenes, all of this just happened and it just worked. Now, I can come here and I can add an event source. So let me go ahead and add an API gateway. And I've gotta come down and configure it. And so uh, we're gonna attach this to, I, I happen to have an existing endpoint for this. And we'll just use what's called the deployment stage. And for security, I'm just gonna say it's totally open. No, that's probably not what you'd want to do in a real world scenario. So now I can go here and save this. And what it tells me down below here now is I have an API endpoint. And I can go and open that up in a new tab. Oops. Oops, oops, oops. None. There we go. Missing a slash. Cool, so now I see again the same text that I saw inside of the Lambda uh, uh, console. And so we can go ahead here, let's, let's test the demo gods real quick. Uh, for those of you who are following along uh, at home as it were on Twitch, uh, you can also go ahead and do this. So let me copy this. Let me open up, uh, actually no, let's do Word. Sorry, one second. So open up a browser. I'm at a full screen here, blank document. Sorry, one second here. Okay, so if you have a browser in front of you, on a phone or anywhere else, go ahead and, and hit this URL. Hit it with, with all of your might. And hopefully for those of you who are following at home on the stream, you should go ahead and be able to see this as well. And I'll give everyone a moment or two to do this. Yep. 
apologies for the obscure string of characters in that bit.ly URL. We get, a, we get a thumbs up from somebody who's been able to hit it and it's loading for them. Cool. All right, so a whole bunch of you in here have been able to hit it. Hoping a whole bunch of you here on Twitch got to hit this. Again, you've seen my amazing web application that simply says hello from the SF loft. Now, if I come back here to the Lambda console and uh, I can go over to a monitoring tab that we have here. And I can go and say I want to see things from the last hour. Uh, and it's still pulling in some of this data here for us in, in near real time. Uh, but what I'm seeing here is that a, a whole bunch of you have gone and you know loaded this application. And so uh, 50 or so it says here right now. I know it takes a little while for the, the metrics to catch up. Either way, right, what have we done? Taken some code, put it into a function, created an API gateway, uh, and put it all out in front of you in just a couple minutes. Didn't set up any servers, didn't set up any operating systems, didn't set up any load balancing, didn't configure any networking, didn't do anything else except just have some code that got executed by uh, about as big a scale as we wanted to throw at it right now. Uh, and again, this is kind of the idea here behind what we're looking for with things like Lambda. Now, this was an incredibly basic example. We didn't talk to any databases. We're not really doing any sort of calculations or anything exciting. But again, very, very low amount of work to get this up and running. So we're at 169 per uh, this time period. So awesome. Let me go back to slides here. Actually, what I'm first going to do, one second here, is I'm actually just going to delete this function. OK. Cool. So let's dive a little bit deeper into, again, Lambda and its capabilities and what you can do with it. So we saw a really brief example of, of a Lambda function here. It's actually the same code that you see here in the, uh, the green box on this slide. And uh, again, this code in this green box represents the most basic, 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 simple Lambda function that you could imagine. Now, in a Lambda function, you must have something that's called the handler. The handler is essentially the insertion point for execution of your function from the Lambda platform. And so uh, that is where we're going to pass in what's called an event object and the context object, which we'll talk about here in a second. And generally, this is where your business logic is, is linked out of. You could call sub functions uh, or you know, other code that exists inside of your deployed uh, application artifact. Uh, but pretty straightforward, you have to have some sort of handler that you, the service then invokes. Now, the event object, you saw me really quickly create just a blank JSON structure. I didn't need to pass anything in there. But typically, the event object contains all sorts of relevant bits of information from the invocation source. So if it was from an API gateway, I would have things like the path parameters, headers, uh, anything else about the request body that was sent in. Uh, I could find out information about the client and the URI they were going to hit and all that kind of stuff. If it was from an S3 bucket, so Amazon Simple Storage Service, I would see things such as the bucket and then the object key uh, and what type of an action it was that was taken on it. And again, depending on the invocation service, anything could be passed in for this. The context object is uh, a little bit different. This is actually something that is generated by the platform. It represents information about both the invocation and the underlying infrastructure that your function is running, uh, configured for. And so you can use this to find out things like log information, total timeout for your function, and, and other bits of information that you might want to interface with from inside of your code. But again, really kind of basic thing that you could do. Now, I mentioned previously uh, that we have a couple of languages that are managed by the Lambda service in the platform, and we provide updates to that uh, periodically in new versions and so forth. But we also had some announcements a couple of weeks ago uh, at reInvent for uh, basically expanding this. So two announcements, which again, we're going to spend almost a full hour on here later today, uh, the Lambda Runtime API, and then Layers. So the Runtime API, I already mentioned, allows you to bring pretty much any language that could run inside of Linux to Lambda. So Lambda runs on Linux behind the scenes. And so uh, we've seen customers bring things like C++ and Rust and PHP and uh, COBOL and C, C, C++, all sorts of things to Lambda. And so you can use the Runtime API, and it's, it's really simple. And, we're, and we'll dive a little bit deeper into that here today. Layers is basically a little different. What Layers allows you to do is create a code artifact for reuse and sharing of things like application dependencies, 
um, libraries that you might want to share across an organization, other snippets of code, even things like configuration files, uh, things like SSL certificates. There's all sorts of stuff you could put inside of a layer and share across. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit more soon. Uh, but again, these were two really big updates for Lambda and, and, and really, really awesome capabilities, which again, we'll, we'll go really deep into later. Now, in terms of pricing for Lambda, you saw something when I went through the console that talked about how many milliseconds it took for my function to execute. You might have also noticed the build duration for my function. So one of the, I think, really cool things about Lambda is that it builds in hundreds of milliseconds of increment. So really, really fine-grained down to uh, you know, what it is that your function is doing and executing versus if you had, say, an instance or a container that you're building for uh, longer periods. Um, when we first launched Lambda, EC2 instances were still billed by the hour. Uh, now they are billed down to, I believe, the second it is. Um, so it's a little bit different, but hundreds of milliseconds still that much more fine-grained for what you're doing. The second kind of factor to how Lambda is priced is based on the memory consumption, or sorry, the memory that you've configured it for. So inside of Lambda today, we support anywhere from 120 megabytes up to three gigabytes of memory that can be available to your function. And now this is actually a really important key part of how you think about application performance in Lambda. Because what comes with um, the cranking up of the memory for the function is the amount of CPU and network uh, throughput that is available to your function. And so as you go from 120 megabytes to 256 megabytes, to 512, to a gig, and so forth, it will proportionally, linearly scale, again, the amount of CPU that you have available to your function. And so quite often what we find is that people maybe misunderstand that it, it can be valuable to crank up the amount of memory for your function to get CPU. So take a little quick example of that. So let's say that we had a true CPU-based workload. So in this case, we're actually going to just do some, some pretty hard math. We're going to calculate 1,000 times all prime numbers that are less than, oh, this is here, a million. And so we're going to do all that in a single function execution. And then we're going to see here that we have configured that against 120 megabytes, 256, 512, and then 1024. So pretty much linear stepping up through the memory configuration. What we see then is the amount of time that it took for that to run. And then we see the uh, cost that it would take for each of those runs to happen. And so pretty straightforward color, quarter, uh, color coding here. Red is the, the worst, and green is the best. And so we can see that with less memory, it took longer. With the most memory, it was the fastest. We can also see that with the least amount of memory, it was the cheapest. But if we note here what the actual difference is then for the cost for 1024, what it actually works out to is that the difference between 128 and 1024 is that we shave off over 10 seconds of execution, and it only costs us 0. .00001 of a dollar. So now, you know, depending on your, what you're doing, depending on what the, the need is of your application, you have to decide if you, know, you want to make that trade off of 10 seconds versus 0. .0001 of a dollar. And again, this is for very CPU-based workloads. Now, I think a lot of people sometimes misunderstand what represents a CPU-based workload today. Um, one thing that's really interesting is if you talk to a lot of other APIs, um, whether they be AWS APIs or external APIs, nowadays SSL communication is actually a lot more compute intensive than it used to be a number of years ago. Uh, and this is because we all use higher bitrate SSL certificates, and so the computational work in handling that encryption is actually logarithmically higher than it used to be for lower bit rates. So these are things that you can explore, and what's great is that it's so easy to turn this knob up, test your function, see how it behaves, uh, and, and understand this difference for yourself. But it's pretty much the number one basic first thing we tell all of our customers who say, I feel like my Lambda's not running as fast as it could, is how much memory have you configured it for? So let's talk a little bit more about some of the other aspects here of Lambda. So across Lambda, we have a number of different execution models. Now, uh, you can think of these as just the, the different ways that we can invoke a Lambda function and how it's going to respond. The first is a synchronous or push-based model. And we saw this in the example before, where we had an API gateway configured to talk to a Lambda function. We made a request to that API, and it almost immediately responded back with the results of what was executed inside of our Lambda function. And so that is a, a synchronous model. We're expecting Lambda to give something back upstream to the invocation source. Now let's take an example of where maybe we take a object, let's say it's an image file, and we upload that to an S3 bucket. 
or we put a message into an Amazon SNS or simple notification service topic. It's going to go into that service. That service then is going to essentially generate the invoke down to Lambda, which will take that message or take that object information and act upon it. In this situation, there's no real path back to the original client that put that message into the topic or put that object into a bucket. And so what's going to happen here is Lambda is going to do the work that it needs to do. It's going to complete that or, or potentially fail or what might happen. Um, but again, there's no reaction back to the client. And so maybe you're building a, a poll model looking for a change or looking for an update or something different. But in this case, that is an asynchronous event. Right? So we're not expecting something to come back. And then lastly, we have poll-based. And so this exists today for a couple of our invocation services. Uh, we see here Amazon DynamoDB listed and Amazon Kinesis. Uh, where we have streams of data that can be made available from those services. And then on the Lambda side, we run a poller that is constantly looking for messages in those streams. And then it will pull those messages out or those changes out and pass them into a Lambda invocation for you. We also do the same thing for Amazon SQS, simple queue service, uh, that uh, it pulls messages in batches out of the queue and puts them into Lambda functions. And so depending on your need, depending on your architecture, depending on what you're building you know, communication or execution off of, these are basically the three different ways that you could think about how you interface with Lambda. Now, it gets much more nuanced with this, and we have uh, an entire presentation or so on uh, how retries and failure handling and how scale plays into all of these. Those are all different factors. But just again, understand that there are different ways of invoking Lambda across the different services that we have. Now, behind all of these is the Lambda API. Now, here at AWS, uh, from pretty much day one, we have been an API-driven organization that builds and provides APIs to our customers. If you use the console or the CLI or any of the SDKs or most of the management tools, pretty much all the management tools that exist in the industry to interface with AWS, at some point you're talking to an AWS API behind the scenes. And so Lambda's no different. So if we go back to the various execution models and the services that interface with Lambda today, uh, they are talking to the Lambda API on your behalf. So the Polar invokes the Lambda API. API Gateway invokes the Lambda API. SQ, uh, SNS and S3 invoke the Lambda API. And so the Lambda API exists, uh, built, again, built into our SDKs, well documented and out there. And there are many times when you actually don't need to use another invocation source. You can just have your own code execute a Lambda function directly. And so in this case, you maybe get a little bit more control, maybe have to take on a little bit more of the work involved, um, but you don't have to use one of the services that we have in front of this. So uh, that there, again, the Lambda API. Now, in talking about the API, one thing that's really critical to Lambda, it's critical to every AWS service, is security. Uh, security is a credible focus for us here at AWS. We think of it as the most important thing that we spend our focus spend and focus our time on. And so Lambda's no different. And since day one of this product, it's had a very unique security kind of model and aspect to it. There's kind of two main things that you have to think about. There is, what is it that my function can do? And apologies here, it looks like some of my, uh, uh, the ordering on this slide, it should be a little bit cleaner than this, but um, the bullets are a little out of line. Uh, so there's, what can my function do? So my function code, can it talk to an S3 bucket? Can it talk to a DynamoDB table? Can it call another AWS API on my behalf? And then there's, who can invoke my function? Is it via an API gateway? Is it via an S3 bucket? Is it open to the world? And I'm going to share out the information for it so that people could call it for some reason. And so two different angles of how you have to think about securing and locking down your function. Uh, when we talk about some of the tooling uh, that we have here in this space in the next session that we'll cover here today, we'll go a bit deeper into how we can simplify this for you. But again, this is the stuff that is critical from a security perspective. By default, Lambda is very locked down. So by default, your function can't talk to other services. By default, no one can invoke your Lambda function. And so you have to enable those things, but you also want to be you know, cautious and thinking about what you are enabling and how you're configuring that. Uh, and so it's a bit different than just having a port open on the internet that you protect with a firewall. Uh, it's again integrated into the API layer and how we think about things here at AWS. Now across all the things that you can do with Lambda, it encompasses almost anything that you can do with compute. Uh, so backing web applications, for example. So we see a lot of companies today that are looking at, uh, say, the new wave of uh, front-end technologies. So things like React and Vue and Angular and that whole ecosystem that exists in building, whether it be a true single-page application or a more complex 
a non-single page application, uh, but, but powering that web application with an API and with compute via Lambda. We also see true backends for things, so whether these be internal microservices inside of a larger architecture, uh, or things that power mobile applications, or even things like IoT devices, uh, that is another place where Lambda plays a role. And there's a lot of devices in the world where uh, maybe things that roll around your apartment or your home and clean it up and vacuum it, some of those talk to Lambda. There are devices that are lights or switches or heating units and things that will talk to Lambda. And so there's a lot of places where Lambda shows up that you may not even realize it today. Uh, data processing, so this is one of the largest use cases that we see today here in Lambda. And this is everything from, say, near real-time streaming analytics of data through batch processing, uh, through ETL workloads. Uh, and today we see this again for all sorts of different use cases. Uh, there are organizations like FINRA, Financial Regulation Agency, that processes a half a trillion events per day in Lambda. Things like stock trades and other events that happen in the market looking for uh, fraudulent aspects and things that happen. Uh, there are companies processing tens of thousands of uh, things like sensor data from devices, again, in the IoT space. There's also companies that are doing things like collecting uh, beacon information from ads or click tracking in websites. And so that's kind of the, the data processing side. Chatbots, so chatbots we see showing up all over the place these days. These are chatbots that can be both internally and externally facing. Um, one of my favorite internal tools at Amazon recently got a chatbot. Uh, I was pretty excited about it. It is behind the scenes powered by uh, Lambda and some of the other technologies that we have. Um, but the chatbot basically simplifies something that would have required me clicking a bunch through an interface. And so again, we see chatbots that are helping externally for customer support. We see companies that build chatbots that face internally for things like this internal tool that we have at Amazon that I use that has one. Uh, it could be things like finance or HR or facilities related, for example. Uh, Alexa, so how many of you have an Alexa capable device at home? Quite a few of you, okay, pretty cool. So when you ask our good friend Alexa to do something, uh, that will invoke what's called a Alexa skill. And then behind that Alexa skill, you need some sort of compute typically to handle what's called the fulfillment of that skill action. And so the Alexa team says that Lambda is the best platform for hosting Alexa skills. Uh, and actually, it's, it's really easy to get started in building it. Um, it's a lot of fun. If you have any impressionable children, spouses, or small animals, you can actually have a lot of fun messing with them and saying things like, uh, so I have a two and a half year old at home, and I could say, you know, Alexa, is it time for Jack to go to bed? And then Alexa can tell him it's time to go to bed. And so he'll listen to the little hockey puck disc on the TV stand, won't listen to dad. But little couple lines of code and you can simplify your life. Um, but either way, Alexa, a lot of fun. Building skills with uh, Lambda, really easy to do. And so uh, good kind of fun hack weekend project. And lastly, IT automation. So IT automation is a place where a lot of our customers first dip their toes. Uh, and we see this plugging into things like um, the various development and management tools that we have here at AWS, everything from doing uh, API analysis of like API calls, to being things that react to CloudWatch alarms, to reacting to uh, events that happen inside of your infrastructure. And then we've seen third-party companies build things like whole compliance frameworks that use Lambda in an event-based model to respond to things that happen. And so uh, a lot of things that can happen here, but this is, again, a, kind of the, the long tail of all the things that are possible with Lambda. So that's Lambda. We're going to move a little bit past Lambda and talk about some more of the serverless space here. Now we're going to have spend a, a full hour here today talking a little bit more about API Gateway. Uh, Amazon API Gateway is uh, another core part of the serverless portfolio that we have here. Um, uh, API Gateway it did not, in, or Amazon API Gateway did not define the API space. Uh, this is uh, API Gateways have existed for a long time now. But what makes Amazon API Gateway really unique is that again it fits with inside of this box of what is serverless, and it has a number of really interesting capabilities that it can do that are only really possible inside of a, a cloud environment. Uh, being able to, for example, have things like DDoS protection built in, uh, being able to do things like throttling and usage tiers at a very large scale, but also not costing you anything when you're not running it. And our API gateway, which again, we're gonna talk about in a lot of depth here later, has a number of different ways that it can be configured. It can be configured to have what are called edge endpoints, which are fronted by a CDN, can have regional endpoints that only exist in an AWS region, have private endpoints for things like internal microservices, 
And then what back that API could be everything from Lambda to containers to traditional compute to pretty much any HTTP facing service on the internet. So really robust product and we're gonna spend a full hour exploring and talking about API Gateway today. And then just sticking on, on API Gateway here for another moment or two, uh, we did just announce at reInvent uh, WebSocket support for API Gateway. This is one of the most heavily requested features since we announced the product a little over three and a half years ago. Uh, WebSockets are an interesting technology in how they're changing how people think about building uh, near real-time dashboards and interactivity in applications. And so we see customers using this for, for all sorts of different means, but uh, this is a pretty tricky thing to do at scale. Because um, typically what happens with WebSockets, and we'll talk about this a little more later, is you have to maintain state information somewhere. And typically you've done that on a compute tier, which means that if you have to maintain state, doing that in something like Lambda, which is very much ephemeral, you really can't do. What's interesting about this is that uh, API Gateway in this case manages the state for you. And so you could use Lambda to back a WebSockets API. And so you can get all the benefits basically of serverless uh, and WebSockets, which is, again, something that didn't exist before six weeks ago, and so something that we're pretty excited about. And what all this lends itself to is something that we're seeing really kind of changing the industry in a number of different ways. Um, I've worked with large enterprise companies here at AWS for, again, over the last six years. And when we go and see large enterprises, they will have hundreds of applications inside of their portfolio. And many of these are really basic, effectively, web applications. Now, traditionally, they've been things like you know, Java enterprise applications that are traditional two or three tier apps where they've got a, a web tier and an app tier and a database, uh, and they run on some number of servers, and maybe they're largely, a, again, a nine to five kind of organization, or they have very light usage of certain applications, but all that stuff will run on servers somewhere, taking up time, taking up operational overhead. We've had a number of examples of, of companies uh, move over to this model of a serverless web application, where they will have, again, the kind of new age uh, front end technologies like React or Vue or Angular, JavaScript frameworks, et cetera, where you can host that information in something like S3. So S3 can be configured as a web server. Could optionally put a CDN in front of that, like CloudFront, and serve that traffic out for that if it was something external. And then have all of the business logic basically being served by API Gateway and Lambda. And so with the exception of wherever maybe your database might live, all of the rest of this is serverless. When it's not in use, you're not paying for it. When you need it, it can near instantaneously respond to those requests. And so we are seeing uh, enterprise organizations just shutting down tons of servers, simplifying their costs, greatly reducing cost. Uh, companies that are talking about 50 plus percent savings on terms of the, uh, these applications. And so it's really, really transformative. And I think we're going to see a really huge shift over the next couple of years of the maturity in this space. Um, there's an awesome organization that's local here to San Francisco, uh, Netlify, that's kind of in the lead of some of this space as well, um, and, and a number of other companies. But really cool, exciting stuff that's going on here. Beyond uh, APIs, again, there's a number of different things that you can do with this, just to quickly walk through some more examples. Uh, so again, I can have a model by where I put an object into an S3 bucket. And now this object could be a photo, a video, a log file. It could be a document from my Salesforce. It could be a medical record. It could be an x-ray image. It could be a blob of data that came out of a device that generates some sort of unique blob of data. Uh, and it goes into the S3 bucket. And so S3 is meant for you know, infinite internet scale storage. You just throw data into it. It scales. You don't need to think about it. And then S3 can go and invoke Lambda. And so you could take that data and you can transform it, transcode it, resize it, reshape it, do uh, ML and AI workloads on it, um, all sorts of things that you could do with this. Um, and so uh, with, again, the tie to Lambda, you're not maintaining stateful compute services behind the scenes. With SNS, so simple notification service, this is something that we see as kind of a bridge sometimes between microservices, has a number of different capabilities that make it really useful for that. And so uh, messages can go into, again, what are called topics. Uh, SNS, again, is meant for massive, massive scale. And so like the you know, event buses of old, as it were, um, those messages can go in and then invoke Lambda functions on your behalf. SQS, simple queue service, same kind of thing. You want to batch up some sort of workload of information, uh, pull out that, uh, those 
that workload from that queue over some period of time and execute upon it. Uh, this is also really popular in a microservices context where you might have a lot of fluctuation of scale up and scale down. Uh, and that's something that SQS handles really, really well. Uh, really heavily used internally at Amazon across the world for lots of different use cases. Uh, Kinesis, which I talked a little bit about before. So Kinesis shows up in everything from uh, click tracking to IoT sensor information to log data. Uh, any place where you need to ingest a massive amount of content, uh, Kinesis can handle that. And then we run a polling service, pulls that data out, and you can act upon that data. Uh, Lex, this is a technology that is a chatbot service. Uh, it's also very core to Alexa itself. And so when you have your chatbot or you have your Alexa skill, behind the scenes when you have to do what's called fulfillment of that conversation or that action that you're taking with that bot or Alexa, uh, you can invoke a Lambda function. And then lastly, again, I'm, a, I'm an old sysadmin ops guy. I've spent years in data centers uh, cutting my hands on, on racks and uh, the little nuts that you have to put in the racks and losing those and stuff like that. Uh, I've also run a lot of cron jobs in my life. And so cron jobs, pretty basic. Um, but you have all sorts of things where cron jobs become critical. And you think about how you HA your cron jobs and how you make sure that they ran, and that they ran well, and they did all these things. Uh, one of my favorite use cases for Lambda is basically to replace cron. And so uh, we have a service called CloudWatch Events, which supports something called scheduled events. And uh, with that, you can invoke a Lambda function at a certain time. Uh, you can do fun things with this. We have another service called Run Command. Surprisingly enough, it allows you to run commands uh, on server-based systems. And so you can use CloudWatch events, Lambda, and run command to execute effectively shell scripts and other things like that on your operating systems uh, without having to manage those servers and think about it that way. So basic workload, but again, it's these kind of things which can save you time and save you effort and, and just pay for themselves over time. We'll end today talking about uh, one of my favorite services in this space, uh, which is a service called AWS Step Functions. And so when we talk about Lambda, and we talk about this concept of event-driven compute, and we talk about the decomposition of a traditional app into both microservices, but then this finer granularity that Lambda offers up, one of the things that customers tend to do is build a lot of orchestration into their code. You think about having one Lambda function, call another Lambda function, call another Lambda function. And now this can lead to a lot of undesired consequences um, due to limits of Lambda, purposeful limits that we have, but also just things that you really don't want to do. And so you know, what step functions do is it basically can handle workflow management for you. It can allow you to do things like have decision trees and parallelization and retry and failure handling. And we're going to go into a lot more depth here at the end of today uh, talking about step functions. But it's a, a really cool core part of the serverless space for us here at AWS. Uh, and, and, and something that just a couple weeks ago got a lot more capability. Now, rounding out the platform here, um, one thing that's really important to a lot of our customers is uh, that quite a lot of you have workloads that have to meet certain compliance standards and regimes. So uh, you know, if you're processing things like credit card transactions or monetary transactions, uh, the PCI standard is very, very important to you. If you were dealing with uh, healthcare records, personal identifiable information, uh, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, HIPAA is a regulation that you'll spend a lot of time with. Uh, if you happen to be in the public sector and you have to deal with things like FedRAMP or various other government compliance uh, and accreditation uh, aspects, the great thing is now, or, or the great thing for now for quite some time in the serverless space is that pretty much across the portfolio, we have those checkbox checked. So if you need to build a healthcare application, you can do it completely servicely. If you have to build credit card processing or financial record uh, processing, uh, you can do that servicely. And so across the portfolio of products that we have, uh, all the ones that we've talked about today and some of the ones that we won't get to, uh, you can you know, go and read about how we can help you solve the problems that you have with these products. Cool, so where do you start? Right? We showed me hopping into the console before firing up a function, setting up an API gateway without security, uh, sharing it to the world via bit.ly link, which was dangerous and dumb and not something that you want to do in the real world when it's your credit card that is attached to the AWS account. Thankfully, I'm an Amazon employee, and uh, as long as I don't bill a whole lot, I, I don't get in trouble. But for you, it might be a different story. So typically, you're not going to just go into the console, create your whole business application, and away you go. Typically what you're going to do is either use the traditional tools that you might have, so the IDE of your choice, however you might write code, uh, whether it be a more complex IDE, 
whether it be something like Notepad, whether it be something like VI, uh, as long as it's not Emacs, you're okay. Okay, a couple people got the joke, a couple didn't. It's early in the morning, that's fine. Um, but where I like to recommend people start is with a framework. And so, uh, you know, here we are kind of four plus years into this space. There are an awesome number of frameworks that are out there, really great companies that are building tools uh, for various reasons. We have some tools as well. Um, one of the most popular ones is the serverless framework. You'll see it here with kind of a, a red logo over on the, the far side of the slide here. Uh, one of the first frameworks, one of the most robust ones that exists out there. Um, then there's a couple others that are tied more to specific languages. So Claudia.js, as the name might align, is a JavaScript-based tool. It has specific capabilities primarily around chatbots and APIs, for example. Uh, Sparta is a framework for Go. Uh, and so really kind of awesome capabilities that they've done there to help simplify building applications and go on Lambda. Apex, Architect, all other good tools. Uh, Zappa is a Python framework. Uh, and there are a number of other ones that are out there. There's also a number of companies that have built interactions with Lambda so that you don't have to deal with any of these. Uh, so I mentioned Netlify before, which can help with hosting single page applications. They have the ability to plug into Lambda. Uh, companies like Twilio can plug into Lambda for interfacing with things like chatbots and SMS bots and stuff like that. Uh, on our side, we're actually next, uh, the next hour here, going to talk about AWS SAM, this wonderful little squirrel friend of ours. Uh, my good buddy here, Eric, in the back of the room, who is uh, another developer advocate for serverless here at AWS. Uh, we have a whole pile of stickers for you all of our good friend Sam, which again we'll talk about here in a later. So you get to leave with some, some fun stickers hopefully here today. And then we've got a couple other tools and frameworks. Uh, AWS Chalice actually came out of the CLI and SDKs tool team here at AWS. Uh, they started building this tool internally to do some stuff and then open sourced it and it's been really popular. It's a Python framework. Uh, and then AWS Amplify, which is a, a mix between kind of a front end and back end management tool suite. A whole bunch of different capabilities can also help you manage functions. So I encourage people, start with one of these frameworks. They're gonna make your life better. We'll talk about Sam here in a little bit so you can see that. But uh, you know, instead of just opening up a, a terminal window or an IDE somewhere and hacking away, take a look at some of these tools. The other thing that we have here, which we'll talk about a little bit here later today, is the serverless application repository. Uh, this is a place where you as a developer can go and share publicly or privately inside of an organization entire serverless applications. It's basically the highest level of reuse and sharing of you know, software that you could think of. It's, it's almost akin to a open source free marketplace of commercial software or free software, open software that you could find uh, that fits in the serverless world. And so you can come in here and you can search and find all sorts of things. From an educational standpoint, it's an incredibly valuable tool. Uh, you can come in and find, again, almost anything that you want uh, example-wise and learn from it. And so with that, I'm actually going to uh, hop to a quick demo here for uh, just that, and then we will break here for the end of the session. Great. So I'm gonna come back to my console here and click on create function. Uh, if I then go over to the far right here, and sorry, because I zoomed in, the text is a little squished on this box. I'm gonna go to the application, uh, the serverless application repository. We can see here that there are, you know, 36 pages or so of applications. It, it grows every day. There's all sorts of things. I see Alexa skills. I see microservice HTTP endpoints. I see an image resizer service. And so some of these will vary from you know, kind of toys up through really interesting kind of full-fledged components of an infrastructure. This was a fun one I found just the other day. And it is a magic eight ball serverless application. And so if you remember those, those fun toys, you know, Magic 8-Ball, you shake it, you ask it a question, you know, does Sally have a crush on me? And it comes back and says, you know, not in your dreams. Um, uh, so you can now basically uh, shake your laptop and do that. Not quite, but we'll see. So uh, what I have here is all sorts of information. I can go and I can open up the GitHub repository for this. I can see the what's called SAM template, which again we'll talk about here in a little bit later that was used to launch this. I can find what permissions it needs, what software license is attached to it, if there's a readme file that's been set up. But I'm just gonna go ahead and deploy this. So what's happening behind the scenes is this application now is gonna be deployed inside of my account with all of the resources that it needs. Oh, ah, hold on one second. 
It's because I already have one in this region and it uses some of the same names. Hold on a second. Come to a different region, try that again. Great, so again, what's happening here is the uh, service application repository is taking this application that was shared by this other developer and launching it inside of my account. Now, typically, you'd want to go and explore this, read about it a little further, take a peek at the code, understand what you know, is going on into this. Um, we put certain kind of safety controls in place to uh, you know, help for a certain amount of you know, potentially bad actors. But uh, if we look here in the resources window, we see that it's creating a bunch of different AWS resources for me. It's creating a function, it's creating permissions and a role, it's creating an API endpoint. Cool, so it looks like we're all done. So let's go here, click on this function. So I'm in the console for this here. I see I have my function. It's got a whole bunch of code, it's just a Python. It's pretty straightforward actually, it's only 70 or so lines of code, and a good 20 or so lines are the, the responses that my Magic 8-Ball can give me. And so let me go ahead real quick here and test this. I think if I create a blank event, it should be okay. Call this blank, Apple. Okay, click test. Cool. So uh, again, tested it in the console. It's firing up behind the scenes. So we can see here this spit out uh, a response and it's a bunch of HTML, so that's cool. So let's come down here now and actually find the API gateway endpoint. So I click on the trigger, I get the endpoint and I can go and open this up in a new tab. Okay, uh, all right, um, so let's see. Uh, Magic 8-Ball, is everyone in this room excited about today's presentation? Most likely, good. Great, thank you, Magic 8 Paul. That could have gone a really different way, and so I'm pretty happy about that. Um, so, you know, again, we can come here and and poke the uh, the demo guides, and uh, you know, I can copy this linked address. We can go over here to our good friend Bitly and copy that. Do that. So once again here, if you've got a browser open in front of you, feel free to give it, whoa, whoa, whoa. feel free to give this a test. Never send a Bitly link to a text-to-speech app. Um, it doesn't work out too well, as you can see from the way that this link looks. So, kind of a fun thing to do to generate random noise, though. Cool, so I see some magic eight balls loading up here on people's screens. Uh, and again, right, so we, we have here a a bit more of a full-fledged application than the original thing that I had that just spit out hello from the loft. In this case, you can actually, from Lambda, return, you know, in this case, we're seeing HTML content, some CSS and stuff, and, uh, you know, kind of get this little UI and interface. Uh, and this is happening just inside of my API gateway that's returning this. Uh, so again, various capabilities of API gateway being shown off behind the scenes. But, didn't set up any servers, didn't install any operating systems, didn't run any software locally. Uh, I'm not thinking about you know, patching for this. I'm not thinking about networking. Uh, all of you have been able to hit it. I haven't had to scale it or think about anything like that. Again, that's kind of the beauty and the power of serverless. Cool. So uh, again, we've got a full day of, of content and talking points around this. This is just kind of the early introduction to Lambda and to what serverless applications are. Uh, again, we're going to be talking a lot more in depth today next about some of our tooling. Uh, and then the session after that will be around layers and the runtime API. In the afternoon, we're going to have a really uh, deep dive into API Gateway 
and then finishing up with step functions. So hopefully here by the end of the day, you've got a really good view into what serverless is and how it works. Uh, for those of you who are here following on the Twitch stream, appreciate your participation in this. Uh, we're going to try to address some of the questions that we can here during the break as well. Um, and hopefully you stick around here for the rest of the day with us as well. A lot of what I talked about here today can be found off of the serverless landing page that we have. So aws to amazon.com slash serverless. This is the, the home page for all sorts of content. You can see kind of at the, the white bar that's towards the top of the screen there, uh, a link to the serverless application repository, uh, a link to our developer tools section, which includes links to some of those third-party frameworks I mentioned, uh, links to resources. So these are things like tech talks, uh, webinars, blog posts, white papers, case studies, reference architectures, getting started guides, so many different things. Uh, links to AWS partners, these are both companies that provide technology to interface or build with serverless, as well as organizations that uh, could come and help your company build something serverless. Uh, if, if you have to drop off here, uh, again, my name's Chris Munns. I am principal developer advocate for serverless here at AWS based out of New York City. Uh, you can find me at munns at amazon.com or at Chris Munns on Twitter. Uh, feel free to come and uh, uh, interface me on either of those two, and I'm happy to help you with that. Again, we here in the loft are going to take a couple minute break between sessions, um, but uh, happy to handle questions. We'll be keeping on top of the questions here in Twitch today as well. And so thank you, and we'll see you in just a couple minutes.